Coming up on this episode of Nintendo Cartridge Society, it's probably worth noting that it costs more than you think. It's dangerous to go alone, so the Nintendo Cartridge Society goes with you. Welcome to Nintendo Cartridge Society. My name is Patrick Ellers, and I am joined, as I am always joined, by my co-host, Mark Mitchell. We've got a good show for you today. We're going to be talking about the news from the week, including a record-breaking year for the Pokemon Company. And then on Thursday, we're talking special editions with special guest, Barry Carenza. But Mark, in the meantime, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Patrick. I got a haircut this past weekend. And Very good. You looking got sharp. A, thank you. You got a haircut not that long ago. That's true. Look, I, I we're know, short hair boys. We're on. We are short hair boys. We are on the record on this show saying that we're universally body negative. That's Bodies true. are disgusting. But I got to say, we're looking pretty fresh. We are looking pretty fresh. Mark, I went to the beach yesterday. Whoa. Yeah. Uh, and I, I like uh, at, at the cajoling of some of my friends took like a, a beach pick. Right? Uh-huh. I'm like, this is me looking like good. And it's, uh, you know, put it up on Instagram and like, you know, people are like, hey, Patrick looks pretty good. Yeah. F- I mean, what what can I say? We're um, we're handsome men. We're feeling our summer oats. Um, And look, I don't know. Do we need to change our policy? Is is our universal body negativity too negative of a thing for this show? Well, uh, just <laughs> we used to be universally body positive. That's right. Until we actually started digging into how disgusting like the human body right, is. Right. And so it's it's like. It's not a commentary on anyone. We're all in this together. Right. No one should feel bad about their bodies. No, I'm a disgusting pile. (laughs) You know, I'm a disgusting sack of meat. I'm pulling the plug on it. With a good haircut. With a nice haircut. (laughs) I'm pulling the plug on it. We're body positive again. (laughs) Okay. All right. That's right. Universally body positive. Universally body positive. We're swinging back around. I'm a beautiful sack of meat with a nice haircut. A beautiful sack of meat. Speaking of beautiful sacks of meat, my copy of Sonic Forces for the Nintendo Switch. Would you like to borrow it? You can. All you got to do is email us at Nintendo Cartridge Society at, at gmail.com. gmail.com and give us a mailing address. We can send you my copy of Sonic Forces. You play it for as long as you want. You send it back. I have paid for postage both ways. There, Mark, let me tell you, there's a list at this point, and it takes a while to get through this list because, honest to God, I, I I see Sonic Forces, I drop it off at the post office, I don't see that thing again for like two months, <laughs> uh, and we've been doing the show a long time, so the list is long, but that does that it shouldn't discourage anyone from getting on that list. No, good things come to those who wait, and yes. honestly, why pay for a copy of Sonic Forces? If you don't have to, yeah, absolutely. Also, there may be a copy of Untitled Goose Game in there. So, really, if you're if you're signing up for this program because you need to play Sonic Forces at some point in your life, this is a backup plan. I guess is what I'm saying. Backup plan at best. Yeah. Okay. Because you may get it, but it would it could, it's possible that it could be Untitled Goose Game. That's right. That's right. And I know that we've and. We've talked about this a lot, so I apologize if we if this has come <laughs> have up. Have we before. talked about this too much? <laughs> um, I know that we've said that you can't request Untitled Goose Game. That's right. But and have you... we said that you can't request either? Or yes, like, that's could right. You... Oh, okay, okay. Well, I mean, you can request whatever you want. Oh, right. It'll just be ignored. Right, that's right. Yeah. Uh, we you you get the one that's up next to go out. But again, don't let any of this dissuade don't you. Don't let it dissuade it is you. The perfect program. That's right. Another thing you can do is in our quest for. For perfection, which really, now that I think about it, this show is probably just like on a constant quest for perfection. Once we reach perfection, it'll just be over. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, You can leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere that you get your podcasts. Like Andros, who left us a five-star review on Spotify. Thank you so much, Andros. Thank you, Andros. Now, here's a really cool thing that Andros did. He left us a five-star review on Spotify, but we can't see that because only on the U.S. Apple Podcast Store are we able to see like the usernames of people who left us reviews. So Andros let us know that he left a review so we could give him a shout-out on the show. And you can do the same thing. If yes. you leave us a review on the U.S. Apple Podcast Store, we'll see it and we'll give you a shout-out. We'll see it automatically. Yes. Without well, even thinking, we'll just be like, huh? And we'll see it. 
I mean, it doesn't exactly work like that. It's like we don't even think about it. We just see them. <laughs> I mean, I have to go look, but uh, it's it part of the routine at this point. It off on the inside of our eyelids, uh-huh. and we just see it in our when our eyes are closed, Mark. That's right. Well, because our eyelids are perfect at this point. Beautiful, right? Is that what we're saying? Yeah, that's Not right. perfect, just beautiful. Uh, j- just we're positive about <laughs> that's it. That's right. That's right. We're positive about it. Whatever state our, li- our eyelids are in. But the important thing is that if you leave us a review anywhere else that's not the U.S. Apple Podcast Store, we can't see it, but we'd still love to give you a shout-out. So uh, hit us up on Twitter, send us an email, and let us know. Or let us know in our Discord, which you should definitely be a part of. Um, the way to get into the Discord is to email us, Nintendo Cartridge Society at, at gmail.com, gmail.com, or DM us on Twitter, or even just at us on Twitter. Uh, we'll be happy to invite you in there. It is invite-only, so it's an exclusive little group of people having a nice time talking about nice Nintendo things. Um, it's been a delight to hang out there the last couple of weeks since we started it. Um, so get in mark are you ready to uh, start talking about what we've been playing this week yeah let's do it mario strikers battle league not out for a couple weeks still they are holding a first kick which is the sort of uh, test, uh, test punch, test, whatever, the sort of like network stress test that they've been doing. Um, and uh, it started, they started this weekend. There actually was a kick this weekend, or no, was it so, just the, okay. Yeah. So right now you can download the, uh, what do they call the first kick? Yes. Um, which is like a discrete download. And you can download it, and you can run through all of the tutorials. Yes. So um, this is what I've done so far. Yeah, same. And and I was like, oh, I to play online. And I was like, I click it. I'm going to try to play online. And it says, no. No, you can't play online. Yeah, not yet. until later. Okay. I wasn't sure if like there were discrete windows, and I just hadn't like looked it up. There uh, are discrete windows, but they haven't happened yet. They have, got it, got it, got it, got it. So I made my way through the tutorial. Did you get a, a chance to mess around yes, with it? Yes, I did. How are you feeling about Mario Strikers Battle League I at this point? I am going to get my butt kicked in online play. Just I can straight tell. handed to me. Because yeah. I have never, I mean, it's one of the reasons why I've never like excelled or really put a lot of times into fighting games is because like button combinations and needing to remember like complicated button combos in the heat of gameplay has mm-hmm. never been something that I've excelled at. And, you know, like, not that each individual thing is necessarily difficult to pull off. So the tutorials, you know, it'll guide you through each thing individually and it'll say like, hey, try this three times and you don't move forward until you've completed it three times. But then at the end it says, hey, let's put this all together and try to do everything we just learned yeah. in two minutes and 30 seconds, right? Like in this match, in like a real scenario. Right, where you're playing against three blue Yoshis. Uh-huh. Uh, and then, then it's like, okay, well, now you got to like pass between you. You got to do like one charge shot. You got to do one shot where you're like aiming it and all you have to like yeah. You have to dodge some tackles. You have to do some tackles. Yeah. And in there were two times where in like in putting it all together, I couldn't. Where right. it was like, oh no, it was just too like, it was too much for me to try to dodge the tackles from the Yoshi's while also trying to do a charged pass and kick. You know, it just right. like right. did not happen, and that seems like a bad sign for how I'm going to perform because well, I know people are going to master that, right? And of I'm course. just going to get my butt kicked. Well, so I, I feel like I'm in the same boat. I can choose to either win the match in that two minutes and thirty seconds, or do the things that it's telling me to do. <laughs> I cannot do both. You know what I mean? Yep, I do. Um. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, uh, this will be my first, like, Strikers game to actually, like, dig into at all. Um, and uh, so I'm start I'm starting off from a place of I'm intimidated by it. Uh, but I'm looking forward to actually, like, jumping onto the uh, real test kicks uh, once the, the online play gets activated. Just because I'm always curious about how well the online works. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it'll be fun. It's not clear to me so far if there's, like, single player cups that you can participate in i'm hoping Hmm. that there are so i can kind of like brush up on my skills before jumping into the offline um i also think that again i'm hopeful anyways that when it comes to actually online play that for the purposes of the training it tells you hey like focus on these five things and try to do it all in two minutes and 30 seconds but when i'm playing in real life like I don't have to do that. If I choose That's right. not to really get, get very good at a particular skill, like maybe I'll get 
fingers crossed, really good at other skills that will compensate for not being as skilled in, like, other areas. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, but it does seem like some of the basics will, like, it'll be good to actually master dodging and, well, especially and, and if, like, tackling. and Especially yeah. if other people that you're playing online are totally doing that. Right. The trick is going to be getting in on that first weekend when no one knows the game. <laughs> well, I feel like this demo totally, like, blows that away. Because people no, no, will probably no, no. be, like, that, mastering it. Okay, but that's only the people who are, like, really hyper paying attention. That's you true. Know? Like, that's it'll, true. It'll, it'll, it'll be a little bit um, before people get good at also, it. Also, don't let this dissuade anybody from joining Patrick and I's club that we're going to set up. That's right. Because, yes, I might be bad, but I need everybody else to carry me. Yes, at, well, 100%. We will uh, – the, the game does have the ability to set up, like, clubs in it, uh, and we are – 100% going to start a Nintendo Cartridge Society one, and we invite everyone listening to jump in and play soccer with us. Um, uh, Mark and I will both be bad. so uh, Maybe. Maybe. It could turn out that we're really good. Sure. We're just nervous right now. Yeah, that's right. We're untested. <laughs> that's right. Um, Mark, I picked Dragon Quest Builders 2 back up uh, after a little bit of a hiatus. Um, I'm still just really taking my time with it. I know I have all these objectives, um, but the thing that really made me happy um, playing it, I'm building out my uh, furrow field. Is the 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 name of the village that I'm I'm building up right now, um, and uh, I I built them like a sauna, like a, a bathhouse where they can go and like bathe finally because they've just been toiling in in the fields and not been bathing, which is a problem. Um, so I, I I built that and then talked to another character that was like. Uh, so we need a very small room with a pot and a towel rack in it. Do you know what I mean? Like and they're like dancing around the fact they want me to build a bathroom. For them. <laughs> uh, so I built I built them a bathroom, and I gotta say one of the things that this game does, and I think it's probably pretty standard for like this kind of game, um, but it's something that I miss sorely from Animal Crossing, is that. I feel immensely rewarded when the little people in my village are taking advantage of the facilities I've provided to them. Um, the fact that they, uh, after a long day of, of working in the field, they plop themselves down on the dining tables and eat the food that I put out for them, and then they go into the bath, take baths, and then they take a shit and go to bed. Excuse me, pardon my language. <laughs> um, it's so rewarding to see them actually like use stuff. Um, I can't tell you the number of things I put out on my Animal Crossing island that I just wish the uh, my neighbors would interact with mm -hmm. that they don't. I built a soccer field on uh, my island with the two different soccer goals, and then I made like custom um, floor things so that um, that there are like little goal boxes and like sidelines and everything. And there's a soccer ball in the middle of it. And every now and then I'll see someone bouncing the ball. And I'm like, that's not what you're supposed to do with a soccer ball. It does feel like a real missed opportunity. Because, yeah, in Animal Crossing, you can set out, you know, like fair rides, like little teacups and yeah. everything. And, and no one, they nobody, can't ride them or anything. Nobody does anything. Yeah, nobody, they don't even like, it's, the most they can do is like walk up to something, turn it on. Uh, and then, like, enjoy, like, either, like, just they'll smile at it or clap or something and then turn it off. Like, that's the most they can interact with something. Mark, I built a replica of the Hollywood Bowl on my <laughs> island. <laughs> and they're never up there. <laughs> and I get it. It's a hassle to go to the bowl. So, like, no one really goes all that often. But, like, come on. They should just, they should sit in the seats or, like, someone should sit at the piano and, like, play a tune. Um, and it's sort of a bummer to me that they don't. I love seeing my Dragon Quest builders, uh, villagers, farmers, whatever they are, actually take advantage of the things that I like work laboriously to provide for them. That is cool. That is fun that they like have that level of detail in the game. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's a, uh, you know, it, it's very surface level, like, um, but they, they build their little routines and like, I like seeing them working in the farm. I like seeing them, like some of them are specialized in like watering the crops. And so I see them do that. Like, I don't know. It's all it's all very rewarding. I like it a lot. So I've started playing Kirby 64, the Crystal Shards on Nintendo Switch Online. And um, I just beat the first planet. So it was just Planet Popstar. I'm on to Planet Rockstar now. And I... So it's, it's kind of too early to draw any sort of conclusions on it because it's a Kirby game. So the difficulty is already low. And then it is the first level. So it's like, right. especially difficult to figure out like what this game is actually going to be like once you get into it i remember when i was playing planet robobot a game i ended up loving in the beginning i was like i don't get it it's just kind of you know your stock kirby type game 
Um, and so I'm interested to see where this goes. But playing it, you know, when we were on Super NPCs, we, you and I did not play this during Kirby Month. We That's hadn't right. played this game before, and it wasn't available on the Nintendo 64 Switch Online uh, during Kirby Month. But this game has such a good reputation. When we were on Super NPCs, um, the episode maybe about six weeks ago at this point, with a friend of the show, Connor McCabe and Jeremy Schmidt, uh, Connor talked about really liking this game, and he t- talked about the copy abilities and how you could like combine them. Yeah, and this also came up when Matt Acevedo was on uh, our show to talk about uh, the most recent Kirby. Oh yeah, game. Kirby in the Forgotten Land. That's right. Yeah, that he he also brought up uh, Kirby sixty four, the Crystal Shards, as like a high water point for him. Yeah, and so I went into it expecting to be able to combine copy abilities, and for in- the entirety of Planet Popstar, I which is like three or four levels. I could not figure out how to do it. Hmm. And um, because there's no like tutorial in the game. And it just goes back to like what I, what I feel like I've said before on the show, but I really feel like with these uh, Nintendo switch online uh, releases, they should be including the manuals because all of that Do they inf- not? Can no, you not they, access the manuals? Not the, it's not huh. like there, there's no affordance within Nintendo as far as I know within Nintendo Switch Online programs to pull up manuals. Like they're all available online and that's what I ended up doing was just googling right. it and looking at what the um like but how I'm supposed to accomplish it cuz it's in there, but I feel like manuals were such a big part of video games up and t- through the GameCube era because games didn't have like the in game tutorials that they have now as much. Right. And so all of this information about like a lot of the information about plot or characters or buttons that you're supposed to be using, like the yeah. controls is only available in the manual. And so I almost want to go back and start over because it didn't, didn't take that long to get through planet pop star. So I can play around with, you know, like the combinations from the get go. So you did figure out how to, how I did to do figure the, out the, how the to do it. Abilities. Um, So basically like when you copy something, if you shoot it out of your mouth and hit a- another enemy that has a copy ability, it will combine uh, into like a superstar. Yes. Yeah. Or another thing I didn't realize you can do at all is once you copy or once you inhale something, if you press the L or R trigger, it will, you can like, you like uninhale it and you can carry it. And when you're carrying oh. it, then you throw it at something and it combines as well. But like, I had no way to know that I could throw things after I inhaled it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, uh, that's uh, to my knowledge, and we haven't played every Kirby game. That's not a mechanic in any Kirby game. Yeah. yeah. So I again, I really wish Nintendo would include the manuals. I feel like they did for Virtual Console releases, like in the um, uh, Wii era. But yeah, I think I think you're right. I mean, they they definitely included. Or wait, did they actually include them in the um, uh, classic editions, or were there just like QR codes? That with, yeah, up? with the yeah. classic editions, they had like a website you could go yeah, to okay, where they had right. all of them, which that would also be an improvement. Um, I've also been playing Dragon Quest XI S Echoes of an Elusive Age Definitive Edition for the Nintendo Switch. So a uh, couple of minutes of spoilers. Um, I just got Serena back into my party and am in Arborea for the second time. Yes. So um, Eric's story is completed with like his sister who was cursed to turn everything into gold yep. and turned into that like cool gold dragon thing. Yep. So was that the part that you were talking about? That's or a part is there... that, that, okay. that is like one part that I thought was was very good. Uh, now you you have Serena uh, and, and... I am on the hunt for Veronica. There we like, go. Um, you know, she... It's like Serena's like I can sense her. She's near. Go to this location, but I have not gone to that location yet. Right, right, right. Um, one thing I thought about that was funny about Eric's story is I did like the connection between Eric and his sister, and the, uh, I guess like the facts of the story were interesting. But you kind of like really run up against the limitations of the like animations and the storytelling a yeah. little bit in the game because when they're doing the in engine cutscenes. It can be a little creaky sometimes. And so, you know, Eric finds out that his sister is cursed or gone or whatever it is. And he it was just so stereotypically um, his actions where he just, like, dropped to his knees. It was like, no! Yeah, yeah, yeah. It sure. just made me laugh. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. like, oh, we, we can't do subtlety here. <laughs> 
yeah, I, I, I like the relationship between um, Eric and his sister. I, I, I found it to be uh, fairly compelling. Um, I forgot they're getting that spinoff game, the Dragon Quest Treasures, that's yes. supposed to come out this year or something. But is it coming out here or is it just coming out? It was announced for Worldwide when they mm. had the Dragon Quest thing. And actually, I think last week or two weeks ago, there was some sort of like Dragon Quest presentation in Japan. And Yuji Hori said that we'd be hearing more in like a, the next little bit. So, mm, yeah. As intriguing. we head into announcement season yeah. here. Mark, we'll get to that later. Um, a, 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 any Anything else about uh, your uh, current experiences with Dragon Quest XI, Ness Echoes, and Elusive Age Definitive Edition for the Nintendo Switch? I've got to tell you, the second act has been... Uh, too much of a slog for it has been huh? a slog for me i i felt like the first act had so much just like banger after banger after banger sequence and the second act has been rough um i'm still enjoying it but i don't feel when i was playing the first act it was like i couldn't wait to get back to it right and now during the second act i feel a little bit like i'm continuing to play with the anticipation that it'll get to the highs of the first act again uh, and maybe that poisons it a little bit, uh, mm-hmm. just like ha- having that expectation of like getting back there. I do think so. Once you uh, trip into the third act, which you're getting kind of close to now, um, there is sort of a, an easy off ramp for you, uh, where you can be like, okay, and I'm done. Mm. Um, and uh, I, I messed around a little bit past that point, but I I did not get the full third act experience. Um, oh, so you can roll credits before you like, do the- roll credits, yeah. Before oh, the third act, interesting, yeah, um, and like it is a uh, like a complete experience, and then the game is like, do you want to do one more like crazy thing? And you can do it and engage with it, and I'm excited to talk to you uh, about it and what it like offers you uh, beyond that because it's still so much content, right? Uh-huh. Like, I'm sure you could spend as much time in the third act as you do in the first two combined, um, but like. That's also when the game becomes like sort of hardcore Dragon Quest um, and where strategy becomes way more important in battles um, and where like you're never going to be able to grind enough to just like roll through uh, the boss uh-huh. fights. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, the, the game transforms uh, yet again when a- after the credits roll. How, uh, wow. I did not I did not anticipate it that that's really interesting. And and it's and it's hard to talk about like the method by which that happens. Sure. Without spoiling. Got it. What, without spoiling. Can anything. I ask you one thing? Um, how much time did you spend in Talkington or like? The... Oh, very little. Okay. Yeah. Because I'm wondering, uh, and I would be anybody who has played the game and has experience with it, I'd be super interested in your thoughts. Like, h- how much time it's is it worth investing time there? Because it seems like it could be cool. I so like ta- a lot of Dragon Quest yeah. stuff. Talkington, for those uh, not familiar with it, is the area of the game where you go back and like play chunks of previous Dragon Quest games um, in the sort of like 16-bit art style using your current party, um, and uh, like you can gain extra rewards uh, fr- from doing it. I find the 16-bit version of Dragon Quest XI S. Echoes of Elusive Age Definitive Edition for the Nintendo Switch um, to be way less fun than the normal version. I feel like it's the the combat is slower. Um, I miss the like pretty 3D environments. Um, I think the pixel art is fine, but not nothing really special, mm-hmm. right? Um, so I don't love leaving behind the uh, lush, beautiful, fast experience of the game normally to mess around in uh, Tickington. Yeah, Talkington. I genuinely can't remember. Ticking, talking. <laughs> I I really thought, especially because it's like introduced fairly early in the game, and is like, oh, you'll be back, you know, when you leave after mm-hmm. the brief tutorial. I really thought that the like it was a gameplay mechanic that you had to engage in. I anticipated it'd be part of the story. Yeah, where it was like you'd be really. jumping between these two dimensions, but it seems like it's almost entirely discreet, just like bonus content if you want to engage with it. Yeah, well, and, like, again, just, like, with the identity of the hero as, like, the the luminary of, like, the the world, um, it sort of, like, connects him to all of the previous Mm -hmm. uh, heroes in in Dragon Quest. So it's thematically consistent that you would be, like, reliving or sort of, like, post-living the adventures of of all of these these heroes. But, like, yeah, it's it's not uh, – yeah, it's it's more thematically connected than it is – plot wise yeah that's yeah. really interesting but again if anybody had did like do a lot of the quest in talkington that's where i've landed i'm just do gonna stick with that for now okay good um 
uh, let me know. Like, let me know if it is something that is worth spending my time in. Also, I just want to note that I definitely intend to keep moving forward in Kirby 64, the Crystal Shards. Um, it was just kind of like a bummer that I felt like I didn't have the information I could have had from the beginning. Yeah. 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 Um, I also fully intend to, uh, to play that at some point too. I get, well, we care. Let's, let's, let's get, let's move from what we uh, have been playing. Uh, sorry. One more yes. thing I do want to yes. say about Kirby 64 and the Crystal Shards. It is both, it is both very funny and very cute to see that game in like HD for lack of a better term. Yeah, sure. You know, like there's no CRT filter to, you can turn one to, on though. Can you, how do yeah. you, you do it from the so you can't do it from within the game. You have to do it oh, from the game select screen. You can okay. hit uh, options and yeah, it's it's very funny. Like without any of the grace of you know like yeah. the fuzzy screen, it's just very funny to see it in like bam, like Nintendo sixty four uh, graphics in its purest form. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's also like some of it is very cute because you know you have like King DDD and his render in the game is adorable. Plus the kind of crunchiness that comes with it, just mm -hmm. being unfiltered Nintendo 64 polygons. Some of it is very cute. Uh, well, I look forward to checking it out. Mark, that's what we've been playing this week. Let's get into the, into the new releases and what we might be playing next week. And the reason that I wanted to hold what I was talking about uh, 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 or what I started to talk about until here is that we got some new um, NES uh, uh, and Super NES games on the Nintendo Switch Online. Pinball for the NES, uh, Congo's Caper and Rival Turf for the Super NES. And uh, you're not imagining uh, anything. You haven't heard of those games before, <laughs> uh, if you're anything like me. Um, but Congo's Caper is a, a Data East game. It's sort of considered a successor to Joe and Mac and Joe and Mac 2, both of which have appeared on the um, uh, Super NES Switch Online. And then Rival Turf is a Jellico game um, that is part of the series that includes Brawl Brothers and Peacekeepers, which are also both on Nintendo Switch Online. So if you, like me, very like obsessively arrange the libraries of these things and you're trying to figure out what to do with them, Keep in mind, Congo's Caper can be considered a sequel to Joe and Mac 2. So Joe and Mac, Joe and Mac 2, Congo's Caper, those should be in a line. Um, uh, and then Rival Turf, Brawl Brothers, and Peacekeepers, that's another trilogy oh, nice. that you need to acknowledge when organizing these things. I spent an hour this morning trying to uh, – well, no, I guess it was yesterday – trying to arrange my uh, – uh, these three libraries that all got new games added to them with the Nintendo 64 uh, and just just to like put them together into some semblance of order and it's getting harder it's getting <laughs> harder um, I'm thrilled that pinball is in there now I love NES pinball um, I spent uh, several hours playing it on uh, on Saturday I just love it um, I know it's not a great pinball game and it's weird that there's no music while you're playing like the actual game. There's just sound effects. Is this a Nintendo developed game? Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, it's one of the original black box um, NES games. Got it. Like 1986, 87, something like that. I don't like think that. I've ever played it before. Um, you should check it out. It is fun and weird. Um, there's like a little side game in it when uh, you hit the ball into this little pocket on the, 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 the table. First of all, there's only one table, which is incredible. Uh, one table, and it's two screens tall. Uh, and on the bottom screen, there is... Uh, uh, a pocket that you can hit the ball into and it goes into this like sort of mini game where you're controlling Mario who's got like a platform over his head um, and you're like moving this platform around so that a ball like bounces and like freeze who must be like Pauline right like she's uh, for, like from Donkey from the original Donkey Kong um, kind of wearing the like pink olive oil dress of uh, like uh, Popeye right um but in any event, uh, and you you do that until like you you free her or the ball gets away and then it's back out into the table itself. Um, so I I really loved playing pinball, but I got it's uh, trying to rearrange these libraries in a way that makes sense to me. 
uh, has now crossed the threshold from like fun obsessive thing that I do to like neurotic and bad. Like, <laughs> I don't know how to control. Patrick out here now, like yep. uh, hoping that they never they add never more add games to the libraries. No, I mean at this point I need a bunch more in both the libraries so I can just like tear it all down oh, and sure. start over. Yeah. Um, because the current number of games I'm like, no, it's cr- like I I used to have in, in the NES libraries to have uh Super Mario Brothers, Super Mario Brothers two, Super Mario Brothers three at the top, right? Where I'm like Mario one two three bam kind of got messed up a little bit when they added lost levels a couple of years ago and i was like okay well does that go up here uh with the main series mario do i put it down here in the like uh japanese games where like i create this like wall between games i am actually going to play and games i'm not going to play um but there are so many games up there now that like i decided to put uh the two zelda games up there with uh, mario one two and three so it's like okay here's like the a block and then another like five games below them that include you know like other like big nintendo games that i'm actually excited to play and then, like, I start getting into the black box games, which I also have divided by, like, the type. Because, you know, they're like, this is the arcade series. Uh-huh. This is the action series. This is the sports series. Um, and, like, I don't know how to do it. So it's not just three Donkey Kong games on one uh, on one row. But then since there's only three of them on the row, they're way bigger than the rest of them. It's The, the whole thing is a mess, and I hate it. it. Yeah, it is a little bit of a disaster. I have done basically no organization to mine, mm-hmm. and that doesn't work either i um when i was going back to play super mario world for the episode of super gamer boys that we were on Mm -hmm. um just last week and i could not for the life of me find super mario world because i'm like where is it yeah in this library anymore in the it's a, a a dense library with all these like sp versions which i know i know i've said it before but like you should that shouldn't be a separate like cartridge in the thing like if you have an sp version when i start up the game you can say do you want to do one of these sp versions? And then no and then you just play in the regular game um or even there should be a way to like hide all sp versions yeah listeners if you have like a a way that you organize your library let us know i i would love to know i, I went on reddit to see what people are doing and there is no consensus <laughs> no one knows what they're doing it's chaos out there mark nintendo does it doesn't even feel like nintendo knows what they're doing yeah they're just like here's some new games and just like throwing it up at the top Here all you willy-nilly go. Um, also on Thursday, June second, Card Shark. Is oh yeah, we're in the new releases <laughs> on the Switch eShop. Um, I, you know, had a lot of fun with this demo. What I've decided to do is there are still a few games that I'm working my way through, and so I'm not gonna buy this one yet. I have it on my wish list, kind of like I'm thinking when it gets a price drop someday, that's when I'll go for it. Yeah. Um, and then also on Friday, June third, the Wonder Boy Collection is released on Switch. Yeah, the uh, physical edition of, of the uh, Wonder Boy collection. Um, we also wanted to, of course, shout out that the Mario Striker, Strikers Battle League first kick, the sort of like demo for it. Um, d- is it just uh, all weekend next no, weekend? No, so okay. uh, it starts Friday. Or the times that it's available start Friday, June 3rd, and run through Sunday, June 5th. But like other Nintendo like test kick type things, they they're only like, one or two hour periods where you can participate scattered throughout. So definitely, you know, check online to see when those are in your region. Uh, And then just want to shout out here. There are a a ton of sales happening right now. I think perhaps because of the holiday weekend, Um, but Lego star Wars, the Skywalker saga, a very new game um, is on sale for 47 99, which is like 12 bucks off. Um, So uh, Mark, if you were waiting for a price drop, uh, it it has happened. And I kind of was. Yeah. Um, And then one more thing. Uh, Nintendo is offering players the opportunity to sign up for a seven-day free trial of Nintendo Switch Online. And you might say, oh, yeah, I know. I've done that. There's, like, re-upping it. You can do it again, even if you've already taken advantage of of the free trial. I wonder if now they're just, like, more confident and they're offering. They're Mm. like, no, no, no. Come back. Like, check it out. We've got you know, 70 NES games and, you know, I don't know, a bunch of Super Nintendo games. Uh, so just, just as a reminder, um, this is not the expansion pack, uh, but it, it, you would still have access to online play, uh, the NES online, the Super NES online, Tetris 99, and Pac-Man 99, which is a lot. Uh, so if you are not already subscribing to it, uh, you know, use, use the week to uh, try some of that stuff out. Um, all right, Mark, let's close this segment out. Which brings us to a regular segment on our show. It is time for 433. 
1952, American composer John Cage wrote a piece called 433, wherein a performer or group of performers didn't play their instruments for four minutes and 33 seconds. For the purposes of this show, our instruments are talking about Nintendo. So, for the duration of one performance of 433, Mark and I will talk about something not at all Nintendo-related, thus fulfilling the contract of the piece. Uh, Mark, perhaps disappointing everyone or no one, uh, I'm n- I do not have a taste test for you uh, today like you had for me uh, last week. <laughs> Uh, and instead, we are going to be talking about campfires. I feel like campfires are one of those things that, in theory, are really enjoyable, mm-hmm. but in practice, I don't find to be particularly fun. Do you have a recent experience with a campfire that, uh, th- why it was on your Not mind? Not really. I'm actually trying to think the last time that I was around a live fire. And I, do, I, I don't actually know when that right, would like have been. Right, like a live fire bigger than like a candle. Yeah. You, yeah. You, you got, you're not big candle guys. We're not. Hu- we, we have candles in our We're glancing place. around the room right now. <laughs> Frantically searching yeah. for candles. <laughs> we have them in our place, but no, not like, we're not super frequent candle lighters. Um, I like a campfire. Um, I, I think they generally deliver on the promise of campfire. First of all, smell great, right? Just the smell of burning wood. Uh-huh. I'm there. I'm down for it. <laughs> um, I do. Here's something that is definitely true for me. I need someone else to build that fire. Mm, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not. I can't. And I'm not. <laughs> Were you ever a Boy Scout? Did you ever no. do Scouts? No. Um, I did. And I feel like at one time, you know, uh, they taught us how to start a fire using flint. Okay. But... One, I don't think I could recall it. And two, I don't think I was ever successful in doing it. Yeah. I mean, it sounds difficult. I, I understand, like, the theory of how to build a fire, um, but I've never successfully done it. Mm-hmm. Or received, like, actual instruction in it. So, like, when I say I understand the theory, I mean, like, I've seen them make a fire in a movie. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, I get it. I get it. You lean, o- you <laughs> lean over to Sarah in the movie and are like, I could do that. <laughs> Um, yeah, I guess, like, for me, campfires are, um, if it's cold, you, it's... You need a jacket, Mark. You just need a jacket. I guess you just need a jacket. You just need a jacket, yeah. Because you can never, like, you can't get too close to a campfire. It's uncomfortable. No, it's hot. But if you get too far away, then you're like, well, what's the point? You're like, it's nighttime. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, no, you you need the jacket. Um, but I, I think the just the thing about the fire is that it provides a focal point for like chill outdoor activity. Yes, and it gives something for people to look at other than each other yes. or their phones. Uh huh. Right. Like. Yep. Um, and you know, I uh, I, I think a, a s'more is almost always a disaster, but it's fun to make it. It is. Oh man, s'mores are so good. Campfires yeah. are worth it just for s'mores. I think they're also uh, worth it just for the, like, man, I, I do like sitting outside, right? I, I like I, I like being outside. Usually when you're outside, people are like, let's go for a hike, or let's we need to be doing something. Listeners, you, know what I mean? you cannot see this, but Patrick's eyes could not be rolling more <laughs> when he's describing activities people I love, want to do outside. I love going for a hike. I went for a long <laughs> bike ride today. I, I, I also like being active outside. Um but I also want not to be active outside. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, when when it gets dark, the like tendency to want to be outside goes down. But if you've got a fire going, then, like, that, that alleviates all of it. You can be outside in the dark and not do anything. Yeah. It's the best of all worlds. Mm-hmm. Problem, of course, uh, you know, for, for me growing up in Wisconsin, mosquitoes. Oh, sure, yeah. There's no way to get around it. Mm -hmm. Um, We now live in Los Angeles where there are no mosquitoes. No, that's not – it just depends on where you are. Okay, I've never been anywhere in L.A. where the mosquitoes have been uh, a fraction as bad as they would be any given summer night (laughs) in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. Anywhere in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. Have you ever been on Spaceship Earth at Epcot? Yes. So there's a part... Spaceship Earth takes place in the big ball. Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, it, like, the history of communication or storytelling or whatever. And then um, there's a part where you go by, like, the uh, burning of Rome. And they have this, like, fire smell. Mm. And that, it's um, it's perfect. I just want to live in that uh, fake smell of the burning of Rome from Spaceship Earth. At Epcot. Um, that's so. That's so funny and so specific. I don't... Remember that smell? 
Um, I don't think I really liked Spaceship Earth as a kid. Um, mm-hmm. Epcot's weird for kids. I Epcot think. is weird for kids. Maybe it's weird for adults too. Well, that's why they put a Guardians of the Galaxy roller coaster in there. There you go. <laughs> it's like traveling the universe. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think uh, what what it comes down to for me is I, I am pro campfire. Even though like most of the foods that you can make on campfire, it's s'more, great. Um, but after that, it's like hot dog, and like I can't eat a hot dog. Right. You ever make a hot dog on a campfire? I don't. Uh, not successfully. I don't think. But, you know, as we were talking about, like, I honestly can't even say the last time I was around a campfire. So maybe I, I, I should experience it again so I can really draw judgments as, uh, as an adult. Uh, yes. Uh, that, there we go. That's the end of the performance. Um, I, I like that was a nice measured 433 where we came to the conclusion that we need more experience with the topic yeah. before we can comment further. Um, all right, Mark, let's get into. Oh, sorry. We were accompanied today by an ensemble at the Musical Instrument Museum in Phoenix. Mark, let's get into the news. Patrick, I feel like determining that we're body positive again has really just put everything in a more positive light. Where we're just yeah, like, I think so. Yeah, because uh, we were in danger of starting the episode on like a really negative note. <laughs> I felt it happening and was like, no, we need to write this ship. Sony has announced a state of play presentation for this Thursday. June 2nd at 3 p.m. Pacific time. And the reason we're talking about it yes. is because there's a buzz in the air. Buzz, Should, buzz. It, will Nintendo be having a Nintendo Direct in June? Should Nintendo be having a Nintendo Direct in June? So we now have Sony staking their territory for this week. Xbox is Sunday, June 12th. Do we think that this portends... One way or the other for yes. Nintendo having a presentation in June. So, you know, I have long been of the opinion that it, even just Xbox staking their claim on Sunday, June 12th, the evening of Sunday, June 12th, means that we will have a Nintendo Direct at 10 o'clock on Tuesday, June Wow, 14th. even calling like the time of day. It's That's when it is. It's at 10 o'clock. Um historically uh when when it is coincided with uh e3 and that's when it was last year um not that date specifically but that in relationship to xbox's event um the fact that sony is doing something uh else uh, a- around this time uh kind of doing the thing that they had done in years previous when they didn't want to be part of e3 um just going a week early and like showing something uh makes me think that yeah absolutely like I'm I'm saying Tuesday, June fourteenth for Nintendo Direct. It does. It feels like um, it would make total sense for them to have one. I'm hopeful that they'll have one. Yeah, me too. Um, yeah. Do you think that Sony? I honestly can't recall the last time Sony had a state of place. So then maybe they're just kind of like do one anyways. But do you think the fact that you know Summer Games Fest this year has really staked its claim for June? has also encouraged other presentations in June because there's just going to be like third party announcements and all this other kind of stuff that it just makes sense for their for June to become like the month again. Yeah yeah, I mean I I think I think that's just like kind of how the the marketing beats work, right? That like um there are always like games we don't know about coming out in the latter half of the year. Um, and like, you know, we sort of build up uh, into the beginning of the year um, and like the holidays and stuff, uh, you know, all, all of the releases that are going to be coming out in the first half of the year. And there needs to be that sort of like moment where we're like, OK, we are moving on to what's coming out next um, for the remainder of the year. And I think that June is just the time. for Yeah, that, that makes sense. You're like halfway through the year. Yeah. And we the just, other. just need to know. I mean, it's a. Uh, uh, you know, w- this is always the case with Nintendo where you're like, oh, yeah, you know, kind of we're looking down the next like three months and we can see what they're doing the next three months. But after that, it's kind of like, what are they doing? They also have a Pokemon game of, you know, whatever. Um, But like, I think everyone is kind of there right now. Like, we don't really know what the rest of Sony's year looks like. Right. Um, Is there is the new God of War game actually going to come out this year? We don't know. Um. And uh, Microsoft delayed their uh, Redfall and um, Starfield out of uh, 2022. So, like, they there are literally no Microsoft first-party games on the schedule for the rest of the year. Um, so, like, yeah, we need we the, these events are due. Yeah, I the weird thing I feel like with Nintendo this year is unless they're going to be releasing. 
I guess October is a question mark. But, you yes. know, September, November, we pretty – we know major tent poles throughout all of Nintendo's years. And, yeah, they could sprinkle in, you know, like, um, a, you know, more B-tier title here or there or something. But I – I think they could still drop, like, an A. Like, because uh, when, when, we, when we look at the, the games that are coming out through the end of the year, uh, with the, the, the exception of, of Pokemon, I think they are already Bs and Cs, right? Like – Strikers, a new uh, Fire Emblem Warriors game, um, Xenoblade Chronicles, Xenoblade 3. Chronicles Three, and uh, Splatoon Three. And Splatoon Three. I guess mean, maybe Splatoon is, is an is an A, just as far as like their marketing is concerned. But the others are like B, um, which is not to speak ill of those games. I'm not saying that they're worse games. Uh, I'm just saying like in terms of like their marketing potential is just lower. Yeah. Um, that like I think there's room for another like it does feel big conspicuous one. that there's nothing in October right now. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, yeah, maybe I mean maybe there is room for Nintendo to surprise us for sure. The Pokemon Company recently reported on their year end financial result for fiscal year 2022, revealing that they had a record setting year. The previous fiscal year, which I'm just gonna stick with fiscal years because like mixing yeah. fiscal with Calendar years is a little confusing, but the previous year, fiscal year 2021, was also record-setting year for Pokemon Company's profits, but fiscal year 2022 basically saw profits double, going from 18.6 billion yen in fiscal year 21 to 41 billion yen in fiscal year 22. 41 billion yen. Now, mind you, I don't have really a sense of how valuable yen is. I think but it's hundreds of millions of dollars. It, it is, is like yes. 41 billion is like hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, and it, any way you slice it is more than twice as profitable as the year before, which was uh, up to that point, the most profitable year for the Pokemon company. Pokemon Legends Arceus sold 12.64 million copies and Pokemon Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl sold 14.65 million copies which means over 27 million copies of these new Pokemon games since just November last year. Which is when they launched, uh, which is an absurd thing to consider um, that like it's that plus all of the other like back, uh, it, you know, it, the, we've got um, Pokemon Let's Go Eevee um, and Pikachu. There's a uh, Sword and Shield. There's a Sword and Shield DLC. This isn't taking a, 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 a Pokemon Snap um, like and then all of the uh, online, or not online, but the like Pokemon Unite, um, Go. It's just they, they have so many games that must just be cranking out money. Yeah. So uh, what is the Pokemon Company? I have realized, you know, we've talked about the Pokemon Company in past shows. And I don't know that I necessarily understood the ownership structure of Pokemon and how it breaks down between like Game Freak and Creatures and Nintendo and yes. Pokemon Company and all that kind of stuff. So uh, Cerebi.net, which is just kind of like a uh, great Pokemon like news source, game source, all that sort of stuff, has a good breakdown of the various companies involved in Pokemon. And I sought it out today to try and understand. And so I wanted to share that if, if for anybody else who struggles with this like I do. So the franchise is joint owned by Game Freak, who develops the main series Pokemon games, Nintendo, and a company called Creatures Inc. And the brand is run by the Pokemon company. And the Pokemon company deals with marketing, licensing, and more. So basically, the three pillars are Game Freak, who developed the main series games. Mm -hmm. Creatures Inc. provides support through their Pokemon CG studio, and they do all the models for all elements of the franchise, as well as developing like the CG models, plus develop spin-off titles, and they're in charge of the Pokemon trading card game. And then Nintendo and its subsidiaries that provide technical expertise and assistance in development of the games, as well as developing like peripherals, such as the Pokemon Go Plus. And those three companies have joint ownership of this Pokemon company, which is set up to deal with the licensing, marketing, and deals across the world that involve Pokemon. So it's like the Pokemon company as a singular entity doesn't really exist. It is, in fact, uh, a, a sort of Megazord made up of the individual <laughs> uh, like arms of creatures 
uh, Game Freak and Nintendo. I don't think so. So I think the Pokemon company is an entity. Mm -hmm. It is a, a company that is in charge of licensing. Yes. But the profits funnel to those to Game Freak, Creatures Inc., and Nintendo because they are the ownership of right. the Pokemon company. So when you're mad about something Pokemon does, <laughs> who's responsible? Right. Know where to direct your anger. <laughs> In a recent interview with Japanese outlet 4Gamer, Triangle Strategy producers Tomoya Asano and Yasueki Arai sure. Arai? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Answered some questions about the processing of developing games in the HD 2D art style. Some fun t takeaways here is translated by Nintendo Everything. So on unifying the way the art style works, Asano said, quote, the teams on the former titles released information for the newer teams. If they have information they feel might be useful, we encourage the exchange of information across development companies. If a method of expression was used in an earlier title, there's no reason it can't be incorporated into the newer titles. Um, I like this. I mean, I mean we'll, we'll get to the second quote too, but um, I, I like the idea that developing for um, HD 2D is a such a specific animal that they are like learning new techniques and they're like oh yeah this is how that works in hd 2d um so they can share it from you know the octopath team to the triangle strategy to the live alive to the uh dragon quest 3 team like i i i like that and then another question that came up is why nobody else is doing this sort of like hd 2d style we haven't really seen it ripped off yeah and Asano says, quote, it's probably worth noting that it costs more than you'd think. In that respect, it's a good match for the titles uh, for the titles wanted out of Square Enix. There might not be much to gain from other companies copying it. Um, which is a very, uh, I, I, it's a well ob observed point that like, the, what they they're they're doing it because they have very specific aims. Um, and it is not cheap to do it, which uh, maybe seems counterintuitive, but also like, you know, I, I don't, to, to think that that is an easy or an easy or cheap way to develop a game uh, feels like wholly uninformed, right? Um, the games look expensive to me. I, I don't, I don't. Uh, how, how how do you feel about uh, the HD two D? Do you think it feels like? Yeah, I feel like cheaper? it feels like a, no. I think it feels like a premium product because I think it's impressive, especially in the. Um, world of indie games where you see a lot of uh, pixel art games that ape, ape kind of like a 16, 32 yeah. bit art style and to set itself apart so successfully, it does feel like a premium product. Yeah. Well, cause like there's, there's all of the struggle of um, working in pixel art, which is that like, you know, it's a, it's a weird specific art medium. Not everyone who makes art can also work and not everyone who makes digital art um, can work uh, effectively in pixel art. It is all of the struggles there with all the struggles of making like a beautiful 3D, <laughs> you know what I mean? That there, there's still like uh, these gorgeous um, uh, effects and particles and um, you're still rendering things in like full 3D. Uh, another part that I didn't um, mention here uh, or I didn't pull into our, our show notes um, was that they uh, Octopath Traveler has a, a fixed camera, right? Um, but for uh, Triangle Strategy, you need to be able to rotate the camera 360 degrees. So you have to be able to see off into the horizon in, in all directions. Like it's not a shortcut. Uh, HD 2D is not a shortcut. It's not an easy way to uh, bring a game to, to market. It's uh, expensive and it, Takes a lot of work. Yeah, it seems like we'll be seeing quite a few more games yeah. in that style in the future too. Yeah, and I hope the uh, the other ones hit big. Um, I I don't think that uh, try no triangle strategy and Octopath sold well enough for what they were. Um, but like, I I I don't know if like uh, Dragon Quest three or Live Alive like have the opportunity to like break out of that and really be successful. Um, but I'd be interested to see. Last week was Star Wars Celebration in Anaheim, and there were a few video game announcements kind of related to Nintendo out of that. So Aspire will be bringing Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic 2, the Sith, the Sith Lords, to the Nintendo Switch on June 8th. Um, they released the original Knights of the Old Republic to Switch in November, and the 
release of KOTOR 2 includes HD cinematics, texture upgrades, uh, UI, like general resolution improvements. But kind of the cool thing yeah. is that post-launch, Aspire is promising to bring restored content DLC to the game. Which is interesting. So uh, first, I just want to note, um, June 8th, that's real soon. Yeah. Um, I I don't think I clocked that until you said it just now that like, oh, June 8th it's is next a, week. It's, it's next week. Yeah. It's so soon. Um, so the restored content DLC is interesting because uh, the DLC for KOTOR 2 was famously unfinished, right? That uh, And it sort of like included the like end of well, the game. Well, just basically. the game. For, yes, for, yes. For KOTOR 2 is famously unfinished. Lots yes. of cut content. Lots of cut content. And it's been like the sort of subject of the modding community for a very long time. Um, and I know about this because one of my roommates in Chicago, uh, Andrew, uh, very good friend of mine, uh, was heavily involved in the modding community around um, Knights of the Old Republic 2. So uh, his name appears, or his username, appears in the credits oh, very cool. of, uh, of, of, Co- of KOTOR 2, or it will when it's uh, re-released with some of this re- restored content. Um, but yeah, it's just it's it's crazy that like uh, that they would have this DLC, this like unfinished game, um, and that there were just modders interested in what was going on like under the hood and like try to fix it, try to bring it yeah, all back. Yeah, that's cool. That is really cool. And then that they can bring it back and sell it as a product. <laughs> like it's, yeah, it's, it's all very strange. That is the legality of it escapes me. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's also like you don't have any legal right to be like developing on that. Right. No, it's, yeah, yeah, it's totally, it's, it's, it's all very like, oh, I don't know. We're all just going to be cool with this. <laughs> uh, Nintendo confirmed last well, week. Well, hold on. I want to actually talk about uh, KOTOR. It, oh, sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, we are not Knights of the Old Republic guys, but we are big Star Wars guys. Uh, and when KOTOR, the original came to switch, we were like, Hey, is this like our on-ramp here? Um, turns out, no, it was not. Um, are you interested in, uh, uh, messing around with KOTOR 2. I, Andrew speaks so highly of the game. I know. it. It is supposed to, So it's developed by Obsidian, yes. a developer who is both infamous for having half-finished games like uh, KOTOR 2, um, but also beloved because a lot of those games have really cool mechanics yeah. or really cool stories, really good writing. Obsidian also developed... Um, uh, Fallout New Vegas, Mm -hmm. which many consider to be the high watermark of, you know, the, the Bethesda reboot of that series. Um, I would be interested in checking it out. It's always hard because I, you know, still have Dragon Quest 11 S Echoes and Elucidage Definitive Editions for the Nintendo Switch. And when I finish that, it'll be hard to roll right into another, like, RPG. Right. I'll be at a very different kind of RPG. Totally. Yeah. But, um, yes, I am 100% interested in revisiting these games. How about you? Yes. Uh, I, I think uh, w- I think I may just skip the first one and just go right into the second one. I think one. I might do that, yeah. too. Yeah. Nintendo confirmed last week that Mario Strikers Battle League will receive updates after launch, including additional characters. Additional characters! They also confirmed that the updates will be free, but other than that, we don't have any details. So we don't know for sure that Daisy is going to be in it, but it seems like a good bet. Maybe. Maybe it seems like a good bet. I don't know. It's uh, who, who knows who knows what characters they'll actually uh, end up bringing. Um, I just just for uh, reference sake, I, I pulled um, the list of characters that have been added to Mario Tennis Aces uh, in the year after its launch and uh, Mario Golf Super Rush. Aces got a bunch. Uh, Koopa Troopa, Blooper, Diddy Kong, Shy Guy, Petey Piranha, Luma, Boom Boom, Pauline, Kamek, Dry Bones. Fire Piranha Plant and Dry Bowser, so it's like a dozen extra characters, um, and it got those throughout the course of the year after its launch. Um, and then uh, Mario Golf Super Rush, um, so far has uh, got Toadette, uh, Ninja, Koopa Troopa, Wiggler, and Shy Guy. Um, so if that's far fewer. Um, I, I do think it j- it's interesting to compare the sort of um, post-release support strategies for both these games. Um, Aces got support for a year, right? It came out in June, and the last bit of DLC uh, came out on May 31st. Um, 
Super Rush has been out for almost a year, came out last June, um, but it hasn't received any updates since November. Mm. So I don't know if uh, they cut off the support early for that one or if we're going to get like a, a update out of the blue here where they're like, yeah, and here's five new characters. Um, sort of the uh, uh, Mario Maker 2 strategy where they're like supporting it for a little while and then went dark and they were like, here's a bunch more and we're out. We're never talking about Mario Maker again. Um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, it makes me wonder how long we'll have to wait for the new characters in uh, Battle League and if they will support it for uh, a whole year. I do think it's interesting that these sports games all seem to come out in June. Yeah. That's like that a Mario sports window. Last week, we talked about a potentially game-breaking bug in Kirby 64, the Crystal Shards, as it appears on Nintendo Switch Online and Nintendo 64. Um, in like an underwater level, you can get stuck in this infinite stun cycle, and you don't really have any option yeah. to get out of it. They've promised a patch coming early this week, so it is possible that by the time you're listening to this, a patch has already been released that fixes this issue yeah and the only place that i saw this uh, uh address was on nintendo's twitter account so i imagine that that is also where they will announce that it, it has been fixed uh i'm glad they see it i'm glad they're fixing it uh we had to we called it out last week so we have to call out this week that they are addressing it 2d fighting game them's fight in herds was revealed to be coming to switch this fall officially revealed yes uh we there was a, a leak a while back um and i got excited i was like we got to be coming up on a uh, indie world showcase that turned out not to be true um and then when the indie world showcase did come up i was like now we're gonna find out about them's fighting herds mark we didn't <laughs> <laughs> but now we know didn't appear now um we know the game is coming this fall We'll have cross-platform matchmaking, rollback netcode with GGPO. Doesn't mean anything to me, but uh, if you know, I'm sure you know. This is the good fighting game uh, netcode that uh, allows that. It, 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 it gives the appearance of lagless um, uh, online play. GGPO stands for good game, peace out. And it was like, uh, uh, this is another case of uh, the modding community of an individual who made uh, this netcode that made fighting games work uh, and then got sort of used by everyone uh, who makes uh, online fighters. And there'll be four brand new DLC characters included in a season one pass. I'm excited about this game. This is a game that I've had my eye on for a while. Um, it's a, a, a 2D fighting game with a sort of four button input, sort of Marvel versus Capcom style, um, where all of the characters are some variation of like My Little Pony esque uh, fighter. Um, it's supposed to be very deep. It has a, a an engaging um, single player campaign that is almost a little bit like role playing y. There's like a story mode and all this stuff. Um, I'm very interested in this game. Uh, like I said, it's been on my uh, Steam wish list for a while. They haven't made a Mac version of it yet. Um, so I've just been like kind of waiting for uh, either that or for it to come to consoles. This is it's coming to all consoles. Oh, okay. Um, basically, not not just Switch, um, which is why the cross platform uh, matchmaking is even more exciting there. Um, so yeah, it, it it seems like they're finally bringing this game to like the wider audience, and I'm happy to be a part of that wider audience. And finally, uh, one of the one of my favorite things about the in game world of Splatoon of like the Splatoon universe is the music and how there are different in-universe bands that perform different types of music. Well, Nintendo revealed a new band that will be appearing in Splatoon 3 called Front Row, Road spelled R-O-E. Which is very good. Uh, very good over there. And, and, you know, they had previously revealed the band Seaside, and that was uh, like the letter C side that was revealed last September. It's um, like It's like one less than a B side. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the tweet announcing Front Row reads, The melodious, punkish sound of rock outfit Front Row has been swimming up the charts in Splatsville lately. Here's a sneak peek at one of their songs, See Me, Me Now, that'll appear in Splatoon 3. And of course, C in See Me Now is spelled S-E-A. Mark, do you want to listen to a little yeah, See Me Now? Yeah, let's do it. The Splatoon music just works, man. Yeah. It's so crazy that it's as good as it is. Uh, and that it's as, like, specific as it is. That you can, like, immediately identify it as, like, that's Splatoon mm -hmm. music. 
Um, all right. Uh, all right, Mark. That's I'm going to say all right one more time. All right. <laughs> Let's close this out. That is going to do it for this episode of Nintendo Cartridge Society. Remember, please rate, review, and follow us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or any old place where you can rate, review, or follow. Or any way you can interact with us, just do that. <laughs> if you like the episode, please share it on Facebook or Twitter. Uh, we appreciate it. When you do, you can follow us on Twitter. I'm at Patrick underscore Ellers. Mark is at MKE Mitchell. And the show is at Nin Cart Society. We also have a Facebook page, which is just Nintendo Cartridge Society. Anthony DeLuca made our logo. Our theme music is provided by Apebetty. You can get more of his music by going to apebetty.com or by listening right now. For my co-host, Mark Mitchell, this is Patrick Eller saying thank you for listening. <laughs>